Thanks, Steve. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Oztrack Academy. My name's David Lewis. Um, my co-presenters, Gary Gardner and Jeff Palmer. Um, the three of us do these presentations for Caravan in Queensland at all the Caravan in Queensland shows, um, of which Oztrack's a, a member of the association, and Bernie's asked us to come along and um, try and help everybody understand the complex world of caravanning. It is complex. There's obviously the weights are a little bit of a worry, people getting to know what all these weight terminologies are, but we're going to go through a whole lot more other stuff than that. We're going to talk about safe towing process, uh, pro safe towing ideas or processes that you use as a driver, which is Jeff's specialty, and also Gary's specialty is weight distribution and everything else. It's regarded as anything to do with towing. So we're going to talk about a whole multitude of things today, and um, like Steve said, plenty of room for questions once we get through it all. Just a quick little background about the three of us. First of all, my business is called Weight Check. We're a mobile Weighbridge service. So I started the business four years ago when I saw a need for myself actually to weigh my caravan to find out whether I was compliant. When you hook this car and a caravan together, there's six weight compliances there. The only way you can do that up until four years ago when we started the business was go to the local dump, go to a public Weighbridge. There's two in Brisbane or guess it, basically, that's about it. So the concept of our business is we come to your place, we weigh your car and your caravan on site, we give you a three-page report which identifies all the weight compliances which I'm going to go through shortly. So we do it all on site, then I sit down with you, go through all the exp an explanation of all the terminologies and then go through that report and hopefully we're ticking all the boxes to know, let you know where you sit with all those numbers. It is confusing but we try and take that confusion out of it. It is important that you are compliant in all those areas, um, obviously for insurance, all sorts of reasons. But the main reason I believe you should be compliant, it's your safety. And it's every other safety of every other road user on the road. So again, we cover areas, I look after Brisbane on the Sunshine Coast. I've got a franchised operation at the Gold Coast and a franchised operation in Toowoomba and one in Darwin. If there's one from, anyone from Darwin here, we just started last week. But it's all about trying to help you understand all those numbers and make sure that your car and caravan is compliant. Gary. Dave, thank you very much. So as Dave said, my name's Gary Gardiner. Um, I now operate in the owner operated business called Total Towing Setups. Um, so my business is there to help you get your vehicle in particular set up ready to go on the road. From tow bars to brake controllers to you know, uh, charge wires, Anderson plugs, all that sort of stuff on your vehicle caravan extension mirrors, all those bits and pieces you need for the car to make it legally compliant and safe on the road. That's what my business is for. Um, I have spent the last 12 years working for a little company, that's why I wear their hat, I'm still very loyal to them. I spent the last 12 years working for a company called Heyman Reese, uh, a name which I hope you found fairly good when it comes to tow bars and towing equipment. So most of the stuff I sell new is, is Heyman Reese products, but I can, will and can source whatever particular product you might need or want if you've got a preference for anything in particular. Um, I also do, I'm going to call them vehicle and caravan assessments. So I've got the ability to come out to you a bit like Dave's but not quite where he can, he weighs you to look what nut weights are and everything else. I also now have scales so I can come out to you and weigh your car and your caravan and look at them as from a compatibility point of view to make sure that the, uh, the what's the best, just to assess it really, just to make sure that the, the right amount of ball weight is there you know, the, to relate to the, in relation to the caravan weight and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm mobile, so I come to you anywhere between Noosa, Tweedhead and Toowoomba. So that's me and Jeff. Third party. Third party. <laughs> so I'm Jeff, folks. Like these two gentlemen, I work for myself. I provide the driver training or the towing courses. Right, so I cover an area at the moment from Coffs Harbour right through to Mackay. Although I suppose in Coffs Harbour next week, that's not happening, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rocky's been cancelled, so there's, yeah, it's been a little bit quiet in the last couple of weeks, yeah. So, between the three of us, as Dave said, with Caravan Queensland, we've formed our Talking Towing Group. So three very different fields to try and uh, provide information to people in all these key areas, all reasonably key areas. But when it comes to the training side, who here in the group has spent a little bit of time to learn how to play tennis, play golf? Same machine, make coffee, cook their steak on the barbecue. Who's been to some sort of session? Right, a few of you. All right. Who's done a towing course? No one. Why not? <laughs> Why did you go to the other sessions? 
get some information how to do something or do something better. So why haven't we done a towing course? Interesting, isn't it? All it is is a day of information on how to simplify, do something right, gain information on legality or rules that you may not have been aware of. That's all the day is actually about. And learn how this works with your car. So who can actually close your eyes and reverse your trailer? With your eyes closed. <laughs> okay. I have seen you do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to kick off with my little session. So basically we're doing sort of three little 20-minute sessions here on our own areas. Um, questions we usually try and get when we're finished, don't we? Oh, but we will take them if they're important, if you don't think you can remember them. But what I'm going to start with, I'm going to put us as safe on those road recounts. So I'm going to do a health check. Who does a health check every time before you drive out? And what I mean by health check is, start the driver's door. All right, we're going to do a 360 degree walk around the trailer, make sure everything's correct. So what might be on the driver's door? First thing you've got to check, extension mirrors. Okay, so who's running extension mirrors? Does this trailer behind me require extension mirrors on this car? Yes. 95% of caravans will require an extension mirror on your car. Yeah, there's a basic example. Yeah. You might have the elephant ears, as I call them. Okay, the elephant ears. Gary Fitz, the MSA brand, don't you? Okay. How many of those do we find have never been slid? Out. Quite a lot. That's it. Quite a lot. So, we start our walk down the trailer, so we walk along the side of the car. Who's towing with a ute? Or who's got roof racks on the top? A few people. Are we using the ute to carry goods? Are we using the roof rack to carry goods? Yes. All right. What are you restraining it with? Is it tight? Is it sufficient? There is actually a legal document to tell you how to do it. It's called the Load Restraint Guide. It's only about 36 years old. It's not young. But there is one specifically for your cars now. Okay. Tells you how to restrain to the, anything in or to a vehicle. We get to the hitch in the middle. All right, let's assume that you've done everything correct, so we're just going to look at that. Make sure everything's still as it was. Clips, doors, latches, chains, shackles. They're all still done up tight. Plug's still in. All right. We continue walking down the side of the car. How many things we got down the other side of the caravan to check? Windows? Fridge vents? Hot water, gas heater vents maybe? Tyres? And with tyres we have? And tread, bearings is the one I'm targeting. Yeah, put the hand on the centre of the wheel looking for heat. Okay, for bearings. Glowing red, is that? Glowing red. No, it's a feature of the caravan. It's the neon light came on. Yeah. That's, oh, there you go. That's it. Okay. Sorry. Oh, definitely. The legs are up. Yes. I've seen a few around where the legs are half down, driving around the road. Yep. There's no doors on that side? No. I haven't got around this side yet. <laughs> Getting a step ahead of me. Around the back of the trailer. So nearly all of these, from what I could see, have what mounted to the rear end? Spare tyres. Right? So there's wheel nuts, spare tyres mounted to a bracket. The bracket's usually bolted, a lot of cases, to the frame. The frame is either hinged or bolted to the trailer chassis. So they're all things that can work loose. Give them a regular check, make sure they're all good. Come back around this side, well, obviously, we've got some more windows, some more latches. And if we look around all of these, because they're campers, what don't they have to a traditional caravan? Awning poles. That's a plus. That means if you didn't clip the bottom in on the awning pole, you're not going to get the, mo the uh, motor, police motorcyclist as he rolls past you. It's not going to swing out and strike him. But we've got a power point. We've got a table. Okay. Who's driven down the highway and seen the table down? Oh, yeah, I have. I've got two pictures at home. Been sent to me. Table's down. One anyone, of them had the... Anyone seen one with the table down with the kettle with the on kettle it? kettle still on it? <laughs> okay. That'll be good to see. All right. <laughs> this, the picture I, one of the pictures I got was a big triaxle, centre lane, Pacific Motorway, Springwood, and the side table's down. Okay. 
You know how hard it is to actually get the tension of drivers? There's something actually wrong with their end. It's quite hard. We walk around. So we've actually stopped for morning tea now. So we're going to dunk inside. We're going to have this, the scones, nice coffee. Hopefully not having any harder than coffee, not mixing anything with it. You jump back out. It's electric, it's electric one. <laughs> Won't come down, the electric one. <laughs> All right, you've jumped back out. You're going to continue your walk. More latches, drawers, handles. We've reached this side of the hitch. We're going to inspect anything. That's it. You said it's electric. Does it automatically come up, down, when you open the door? No. Damn. I can just picture that. No, but <laughs> Go on. situation where you've actually locked the door and you're going, you're all ready to go and your steps down. No need to go fiddling through your keys to find the key to open the door, especially if the wife's now inside packing the, and she's got the keys. Little do ring down here, if you pull that out, there you go. Hold it out. You, you can put, put the step, step back up. And lock it back in again and it won't affect electronics. <laughs> But it's a lot easier than saying, hey, you know, screaming, take here, where's the keys? <laughs> and going through all that again. Yeah. That's it. Because we all know every caravan's got 62 keys. That's the one. That's it. <laughs> well, I did have a 200 series on a tow course one day, and when he pulled up, he opened the door, and the treads went down. He closed the door, and the treads went back up. And I got in the car to check something one day and say something, you needed that side step or that tread to actually get into this thing that was that high. And I'm sitting there, I said, I can just picture this. I open the door and the tread doesn't go down. You would literally fall out of that car. I could just picture it, yeah. So we come along and say, we've done some more spe inspections in there, okay? Make sure everything is all good. What sits in the box on these, folks? Gas bottles, okay. So left-hand side, space for two 9 kg gas bottles, 8.5 as they call them today. What sits in that chamber? All right, there is a massive great big yellow sign in there. You are not to pack anything else in that chamber in or around the gas bottles. Zero. What's the purpose of that? No. Mm, no, sort of. All right, so it is to protect the equipment that's in that chamber. So if we did have a gas leak, gas is heavier than air, it will fall to the floor. There is vent holes in the floor. There has to be a minimum of one 25 mil hole which you will find in the bottom of this one sitting here. So if we put low gear in there, it can cause damage, but it could block the vent hole. Okay. What are they allowed for on this side? Sorry? Jerry cans. Yeah. I've got the other one, please, sir. Okay, so I always bring this up because we quite often see these in the wrong place. Traditionally, we are carrying what in this one? Black one. Traditionally, we carry what type of fuel in this one? Diesel. Diesel. Yep. Yeah, it could be yellow, okay, traditionally. We're buying, you can see them bought out of the stores now with a flammable sticker on them. Well, that's not correct. Diesel's not flammable. So that doesn't meet the Australian standards, that one. Traditionally, what have we got in here? Petrol. Petrol. Okay. Where do we never mount this? Where is it not highly recommended to mount this one? Inside the car for fumes, yeah, yeah, where else? Well, okay, that's interesting. All right, not in an impact zone. That is highly flammable. So we see a lot of vans, the uh, holders on the tail end, aren't they? Okay, so it's, I won't say it's illegal, it's very highly frowned upon to put it there, but like they've allowed, we are going to put it in here. Okay. Yes, there is a container there. It's sort of sealing it off. Yes, there is a vent on that side, which is all good. Any vapours. But can we put that highly flammable fuel beside that highly flammable gas? Yeah. Perfectly safe. Perfectly safe. That jerry can's going to be 500 litres. That's a pretty big jerry can. The gas bottle's also got to be 500 litres. What do you think your tow ball weight's going to be? It's never going to happen, is it? So it's deemed compatible to do what they're doing here. Yeah. But then again, if we are storing fuel in there, we don't want to block any vents. 
on the vent holes. So be careful what else you load in there if you are using that for fuel. Any different if you put a generator in there, you've got fuel in it. Okay? Which I've been told some people do use that for to carry their small, small gen set. Yeah. yeah. But just small things to remember. Walk down this side of the car again. If you've got anything on top, anything inside, if you've got another mirror, give it a check. How are we going to determine that you require some extension mirrors? Okay, anybody else? That's a simple way to determine whether you should be running extension mirrors or not. Look down the side of the back and see if you can see the mirror. That's getting pretty close. From the vehicle, you should be able to see. No, from the vehicle, I should be able to sit in the driver's seat. Yep. I should be able to see those posts behind the trailer, right. not see Dave. Know where he's, where he's yeah. So let's put it in some layman's terms. I like things simple. When they put a mirror on the side of a motor car, it's sitting there, it's spaced away from the car. If I stand here at the corner and I look down the side, I see a whole mirror, don't I? So if I put these two in a perfect straight line, and this body sits higher than the position of that mirror, and I stand at the back corner and I look along the side, at this end I want to see a whole mirror minimum. If you can get a whole mirror plus a bit of a gap, we're pretty close to the optimum position. Okay? Layman's terms. You've got to go to three different documents to work all that out. There is a requirement for metres and spacing and angles and all this sort of thing. The Australian design rules, very mathematical, aren't they? To put that bit of glass and that bit of plastic, you need to be a very, very high level mathematician to, to actually work, read it and work it out. I just saw it this morning. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to plug my own. So, on my Total Towing Setups Facebook page, I shared a video this morning, which was done by, I think, RV Daily. Uh, okay. Fantastic explanation. It's it. It's brand new. It's like, it's like a cartoon animation yep. video and explains the angles and everything else and the measurements. Absolutely fantastic. I'm sure it was RV Daily who did it, so check it out on Facebook. Uh, uh, it's the uh, CMC uh, Caravan Motor Club. Um, one yeah, the one again. And yeah. it was on, yeah. There's been a lot around, but simple layman's terms. If we followed behind a refrigerator truck and you, as a driver, you lined yourself up and looked down the edge of the truck, what would you see up the front? You'd see his whole mirror. Yeah. And a bit more. Because by standing away from the edge, it creates a slight angle past the corner of your trailer in behind. So if your mirrors are actually set correctly and all my vehicles I tow, including this one out here, and uh, unlike these two gentlemen, we all tow trailers of some sort, my fifth wheel, I, I can still see a motor car in one mirror or the other at half a car length behind me, if the mirrors are correct. We don't need a camera on the back to know what car's there if your mirrors are actually set correct. In one mirror or the other. And we do need two mirrors. How many cars do you see driving down the road with one extension mirror? Quite a few. Well, that's possible. Yeah. I have lost two on the road at one stage. I have lost two on the road once upon a time. Yeah. So they're all basic little things to keep a check on. Now, one of the questions in there was tyre pressures. Oh, some people put in their little question there, tyre pressures. How are we going to work out the tyre pressure before we go away? Anyone got a real good application on how to work out your tyre pressure? Anybody? No hands are jumping up. Okay. Tie gauge. <laughs> yeah, but what are we meant to be reading on the tie gauge? 45, 65, 92, 106, PSI, 50. There is a mathematical calc. Well, I actually downloaded a calc that's sitting out in the car today. didn't bring the sheets in. There's a few rule of thumbs. None of them are perfect. There is information on the tyre as well. The problem is you've got to put that tyre on the scales to know what it weighs to refer to what's printed on the tyre for tyre pressure. The, the equation is, go on, the weight on the tyre. So we'd have to weigh it, like Jeff says, we've got to weigh that tyre and say there's... Um, X kgs. Say there's uh, 1,500 kilos on it. Um, on the rate, on the tyre rating, there is the maximum allowable load on that tyre and there's also the maximum allowable PSI or KPA. So it's the actual load, the physical load that we weigh on it divided by the maximum allowable load, multiplied by the maximum allowable tyre pressure. It'll work out to, let's say the- A, a PSI. Yeah, so it'll, it'll work out to a PSI. But Jeff's, Jeff's now expand on that a little bit. So we, we've been using a couple, and I think you've reverted to it over the years, yep. haven't you? 
four PSI rule. So whatever you started with as a cold pressure before you've hit the road, when the tyre's warmed up to its maximum running pressure, we don't want it to see it increase any more than four PSI. Four PSI. If you're using air. Yeah, that's it. Nitrogen won't expand. If you're running nitrogen, it won't expand. The PSI rule only works yeah. if you're running just straight air in your tyres, not nitrogen in your tyres. Yeah. Okay. So if it stays, doesn't exceed four, you're pretty close to where you should be for the weight that's sitting on that tyre today and the type of driving you're doing today. Obviously, every day might change. Can you explain how you get the four? How I get the four? Cold. Yeah, from cold yeah. to running temperature. So that could be an hour and a half, two hours, your first stop. Do a check. Because is the pressure in this tyre going to be the same as the pressure in that tyre? No. Okay. How much pressure are you going to keep in your spare while you're travelling? Who carries a pump with them? Because if you had to get the spare off the back and it was flat, what are you going to do? So I usually pump my spare up higher than what I'll be running these on the road. Because a little bit of allowance for it to reduce a bit over time while it sits there. Because you can always let pressure out before you put it back on. Instead of adding to it, especially if you haven't got a tyre gauge. Yeah. Wear and tear, treads, cracking. Well, one of the other one I was put on to many, walls, uh, many, many years ago is if I had a crew cut and after about a, a few days I ran my hand over there, what would you feel? Just little, little spikes sticking up. If you did that to your tyre, so it felt furry, then the tyre pressures you're running are too low for the weight that's on your tyre. They're all guides though, they're all indicators. Nothing's perfect. All right. What other key things do we have on there when we come down to driving? The illustrious sway. No, no, we'll always touch on this one anyway. Okay, always touch on this one in my session. So in your motor vehicle, we have sitting accessible to the driver if the trailer axle weights are over 2,000 kgs especially, what do we have fitted? Electronic brake or electronic control brakes. Yeah. All right, what brand have we got, folks? Who's got Red Arcs? Who's got Heyman Reese? <laughs> Who's running Elect Brake? Who wants Heyman Reese? Yeah. Who's running something different? Who doesn't need to run electric brake control brakes? Anybody? Because you've got something like the little fella sitting outside here. All right. yep. They're still fitted with them. Yeah. yeah. We can fit electric brakes to any trailer size we want, but legally, we have to run electrically controlled brakes when the gross trailer mass has reached 2,000 kgs. Okay. All right, so we'll stick with the tow Pro at the moment. It's the most common fitted here. We have three functions on it. Three key functions. Is everyone aware of that? We've got a blue light, a green light, and a red light. Correct? Blue light is for our highway driving, simple terms. Green light is for your off-road driving. Pretty green, all the trees and surroundings. And the red means it's under braking. The blue light is proportional. All right? So the proportional simply is as the velocity changes in the motor car, so as the harder we brake, the vehicle slows up, the velocity changes. The control box senses that change. And because we're braking harder, it's going to apply a higher voltage to your trailer brakes, so the trailer brakes firm up with what is occurring. All right? Basically phrased that way. We can select the braking level, can't we? Who's come up with the level you think is correct for your particular trailer? Dave, have you gone with yours? Oh, has yours got electric brakes on yours? Yes. Yes. How have you gone with yours? My Hayman Reese brake control. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no, selecting the right level. Selecting the right level to suit your driving. Great, re great right. reply. Because basically you're going to have at least three different settings possibly. 60k an hour, another one for 80k an hour, and another one for 100k an hour. And the reason we're going to have potentially three different settings, it might be four, five, and six for an example, or three, four, and five as an example, is if this mass simply runs faster, it's going to need more braking power to slow it down and pull it up. So we've got to ask the brake controller to brake firmer or brake harder, which means a higher setting at a higher speed. 
So you've actually got a trial and error of that yourself. So on, the tow, on our tow courses, we actually do a good session on that and we try and get the people to derive and understand what they should be feeling behind them through the braking exercises. So they get an idea that they're setting the controller correctly for the speed they're driving. So if I said to you, when I applied the brakes and I squeezed the pedal to the floor because I'm trying to pull up quickly, it's just like someone running away from me and I've just grabbed their t-shirt and just pulled back on their t-shirt a little bit. So they're going, what's, what's that? So you should be feeling like something's happening behind you at whatever speed you're driving, which means the trailer now is probably braking at the right level it should be to suit its weight and speed, but it's braking probably just a little bit higher than what it should be for you to notice something's happening, only marginal. Would there be a reasonable description of we're pretty close to sitting in the driver's seat? Yeah, you'll set it. the passenger might feel it, the driver will feel it, okay? Just enough to know the trailer is braking and you can just feel something's occurring. If you're going to sit back in the seat, it's obviously braking too hard. Wheels are locking up, it's probably braking too hard. All these other little things we give. Or well, what's another key one if we're braking, if the, if the trailer's not braking hard enough? You're going to feel it pushing and what else might trigger on the motor car? ABS, ABS brakes. So if you feel that shutter, is not braking enough for its own weight, so it's not assisting the motor car on the braking. Right. Unfortunately, you do have to trial and error this yourself. I can't give you a setting. Weight, efficiency of wheels, the physical weight on the wheels and the speed where we're going are all determining factors to where we're going to have anything set for your particular trailer on that day. Road conditions, they're all factors. Even tyre pressures. If they're not right, the tyre is going to have a different grip. So all these things will have little, little key factors in determining that. Red. So it goes red from a very, very pale pinkish colour up to a very, very dark strawberry apple style red, doesn't it? The harder we brake. So that's going to come on when we touch the brake pedal. It's also going to come on by doing what? What else does a electric control brake system have fitted with it. Manual override. Or we quite often refer to it as an emergency. Okay. We push the button and we keep it pushed. That suspension, when it's built by the, uh, the guys that build the suspension, they rate the amount of load that you can put on them. So that's called the axle group loading. Um, Axle group loading and GTM in this case on this caravan are the same. So we can have fully loaded when we load this up, we can have 3,000 kilos sitting on those two wheels, one axle, okay? If it was a tandem axle caravan and it was 3,000 kilos, means we can have a 3,000 kilos over those group of axles, okay? But um, this Tanami, uh, yeah, we can have three tonne when we fully load it. Don't forget, we've got, you know, two water tanks, we've got grey tanks, we've got um, everything that goes inside this van is all going to add weight somewhere. Gary's going to go into a little bit shortly about table weight and all that, how that all works. But, um, you know, like I say, you've got a, a certain amount of load you can put on it and you mustn't exceed that load. So that's GTM or gross trailer mass. In, in trucking terms, gross usually means the overall weight of the, of, the, of the truck or whatever. In caravan terms, it only refers to the amount of weight on the axle, okay? So the next one is the aggregate trailer mass. So ATM means what I just said, the loaded weight of the, car of the caravan. So this caravan, we fully load it all up. It's actually exactly the same amount as the axle. If that's, usually that might be, the axle, the GTM might be a little bit less than the ATM, but in this, in this caravan here, we're using real numbers here, what's on it. So the caravan fully loaded can weigh three tonne. So if we put three tonne on the axle, that's as maximum it can be, but we've also got the ball weight to go. Okay, so by, don't forget, by the time we put um, water, how much water, what have we got, about 100? And, 120 litre front, 120 litre rear. So we got 240 kilos, 200, 80 litre grey. Okay, so there we go. So we have 240 litres of water, which is 240 kilos, kilos of weight going into the caravan. Okay, so we can't exceed 3,000 kilos. How do we weigh it? Um, as you can see, there's a wheel pad there. That's one of our wheel pads that we used for weighing the weight on each wheel, 
So we put one, if it's a, four, a tandem axle caravan, we have four of those pads. You can put 1.5 ton on each of those pads. It tells me exact weight on the pad down to half a kilo. Same with the other side. Then what we'd also do is we need to weigh the weight at the tow ball. So basically what we're doing, there's a big crane up there that can lift uh, five tonnes. So if we brought that down here, put a strap underneath this and lifted it up and that had a scale on it, it would tell us exactly what that caravan weighs. So if it came in at 2,995 kilos, we're five, five, five kilos under our compliance rating. So when we look at the tear weight, the unladen weight, and then the loaded weight, 3,000 kilos, if we take that away from that, that tells us how much we can put it in the caravan. This case, my mass will tell me 660 kilos. Okay, so unladen weight at the factory, 2340. Loaded weight, aggregate trailer mass, ATM, 3,000. The difference is 660. So it sounds like a lot of weight, doesn't it? 660 kilos. But, you know, we've just talked now about nearly 250 kilos of water. Um, you know, gas, we got two nines on the front. Yep. Yep, two nines. So we've got nine kilos of bottle, nine kilos of product. So we got another 20 kilos there. You know, it just keeps on adding up and adding up. Um, and don't forget, everything you put in there weighs something. So at the last caravan show in Brisbane for Caravan in Queensland, we mixed it up a little bit and we had a whole heap of gear out here and we thought, okay, let's see if people can guess the weight. How many items do we have? 15? No, it's only about 11 items. 11 items? And they were out of my caravan or Gary's caravan. And the idea was to see if people could pick the weight of what it weighed. Uh, first one I had was my Weber barbecue. You all probably got a Weber Q or a, um, what's the a other Ziggy. one you like? A Ziggy. So Weber Q. Anyone got any ideas what it weighs? So it's, a, it's a, just a little baby one. I had, uh, it's got two, gr two grill plates and another plate and just a hose and wheel like that. About 10, yeah, it was uh, 16, 16 kilos. 16 kilos, wasn't kilos it? Yeah. yeah. So 16 kilos. So it doesn't sound much, but again, We've already put 240, 280 with the gas, another 16, we're now at 300. It just keeps on adding up. We've got 660 to go. What was one of the other interesting well, things? All those items came to 189, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So these items, honestly, it would be as long as that mat. A pile of this, a pile of that. There was a box with uh, hoses and ropes in it. Yep. Um, bedding. Two, two bags for, um, for your luggage. Two, Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was... There you go. Yeah. Fire pit, the food, and stuff, all your fridges, your, your, your yep. fridge food. That's it. Your non-perishable non food, all your you know, tins of spaghetti and baked beans, whatever else you're carrying with you. Um, yep. so did, we had fire, yeah, firewood. I did this payload, minus the water full, minus your gas bottles full, minus the 189, which didn't have pots and pans, and didn't have all those sort of things in that yeah. payload, did it? Mm. This put your annex poles on, so you've actually only got 140 kgs left in this. We've and you've got a huge pile. We've still got to put all that in here yet. You've got a huge payload. 660 is a lot of, that's a lot of weight you're going to put in it. And that's, most, most tandem axle caravans will have a payload of about 600 kilos, thereabouts. This has got 660, which is a fantastic payload. But just on that, most tandem axle caravans I weigh, people will have somewhere between five and 600 kilos of gear in them. So people are a bit shocked years and they say, oh, you're just under, oh, I've got 600 payload. Yep, but you've just about used it. You know, a bag of, um, I had another bag there, which was the bedding. Two pillows, a doona, two sheets, two blankets, and some towels. It was 12, no, it was, no, it was 12. 12 kilos, 12 kilos or something? There. So yeah. it just, you know, as I say, it all just keeps adding up. It's all those little bits. Like I say, that, that, uh, all that gear was lined up on a mat like that, and we got people to sort of have a guess what it weighed. Most people would say, oh, about 100 kilos, 120. It was 187 or 178 yeah, or something. One year, near enough. People are just shaking their head going, I can't, you know, surely that, you know, nearly 200 kilos worth of gear there. Um, so that's three ratings there that we've got to be aware of. We've now got three for that car. Okay, so again, this is where all these numbers all interact. So when we come and weigh your car in a caravan, we need to check all these weights. So we need to weigh every, everything fully loaded is the way I usually describe it. Um, people in the car. I weighed one this morning before I came here. The lady wanted it done today because her three kids are at home and otherwise they'd be at school. And when I got there, the 14 year old, he was taller than me. So he would have probably been, well, I'm 90. So I reckon he would have been every part of 70. And they're heading off around Australia. And yeah, they were actually that close off their car weights, which I'll explain in the moment. But you're part of the payload. 
You're not going to sit in the caravan, you're going to sit in the car, but you're still part of that payload. Right, eh? So we've got a Jeep Grand Cherokee over here. These numbers are all, by the way, uh, these are the actual numbers for these two vehicles. Brake towing capacity. So brake towing capacity means that Jeep is legally allowed to tow a trailer, a boat, a caravan, anything that weighs up to three and a half tonne, 3,500 kilos. So this is uh, Jeep, when they build it, they work out that all the towing capacity, uh, all the numbers on that car, they say, okay, you can legally tow three and a half tonne. Um, so when we tow three and a half tonne, we're allowed to have 350 kilos of download on the tow ball of that Jeep. Now, not all cars will have 10% rule. My BT50 out the front there can tow three and a half tonne, it can have 350 kilos on the ball. What's a good example? CX-5. Any European? Oh, yeah. yeah. Most of the European cars, like your Mercedes, your BMW, that sort of stuff, they don't normally have, if they have a 3,500 kilo tow rating, their tow ball capacity would be more like probably in the 200 to 250 range, sort of 5 to 7% rather than, than 350 kilos like the American vehicles and the, and the Japanese type vehicles. Land Rovers. Land Rovers. They got on them, they only yep. 150 on the tow ball. Yeah. Uh, Nissan Patrols. Yeah, that's a whole nother argument. Nissans yeah, yeah, Nissans are a Nissan, little Nissans bit of an interesting just, bird. Uh, Nissans are a head case. Isn't the new Y62 got a 46 mil receiver or something? No, it's still 50. Still 50, still 50 yeah. mil. But the issue with, issue with all Nissans, not just patrols, but Navarra is the whole lot, is that the closer your car gets to its GVM, which Dave's about to go into, the lighter the ball weight has to be. But it's not by the same amount. So if you're 50 kilos under the GVM, it doesn't mean you can have 50 kilos of bore weight, you can only have like 30 kilos of bore weight. They've got this really strange idea that Nissan, you lose more than what you're actually applying. It's, they're, a, they're a pain in the backside, to be honest. Yeah, but then if you've got a Navara, they go... Navaras don't... I've got a Navara out there, <laughs> thank you very much. I've seen everything bent. <laughs> you got me. Yeah, that was America. <laughs> yeah, so just be aware of that tone. Don't assume it's 10%. Uh, a really good one is a CX-5. I don't weigh many of them, they're not very popular tow vehicle but I weighed one for a gentleman once and he had a little just a little camper you know and he said oh, I'm two ton towing but when you I actually looked it up he was two with ton a, towing CX5? but he was only 100 right. kilos allowed Airfax? on the ball weight yeah. so he's put the two ton caravan behind it ideally you want to have about 10% of that wall which will, Gary's going to go into in a minute but he'd only allowed to have 100 kilos of download on the ball so just be aware of the or don't assume it's 10% so towing capacity gross vehicle mass GVM uh, GVM of the Jeep is fully loaded, it can weigh 29.49, 2,949 kilos. So that means Gary, me, Jeff, we all go away in my Jeep. We put the carton of beer in the back, we put the fridge in the back, we're all part of the payload, load it all up, off we go, we can't exceed 29.49. Then what we do is we decide we're going to take the uh, tsunami here, the tsunami. <laughs> Uh, the Tanami here with us, so Bernie and Steve lend us that, we hook it on the back. As soon as we hook that caravan on the back of that car, whatever that tow ball download is, we're going to show you how we measure that in a minute, whatever that tow ball download is now becomes part of that gross vehicle mass of the car. Okay, so if we weigh the car by itself and it comes in at 27.49, just with us guys in it, and a load of fuel and everything else we put in it, then I've only got 200 kilos left in my ball weight. So if the ball weight of this van is, say, 300, I'm now 100 kilos over my gross vehicle mass. So once again, it's, it's a payload thing. Um, oh, I don't know. Actually, I think the Jeep, I think the tear weight, which is the unladen weight of the Jeep, I think it's, um, it's about 600 kilos of payload, yeah. I think, or thereabouts. So it's probably, yeah, somewhere 23, 49, the tear weight or the curb weight. It's a bit, they're inherently a little bit hard to find out, tear weights and curb weights of cars. The main thing is we can't exceed that a maximum allowable weight. And don't forget, as soon as you put the caravan on the back, whatever the ball weight is becomes part of that gross vehicle mass. We're getting confused yet? Yeah, that's not too bad. One to go. GCM, gross combined mass, gross combination mass. So Jeep say that what you can tow three and a half ton with this, with that, with that car, however, once you load that car up, fully load it with all the people and people, uh, all the gear you're going to put in it, and load this caravan up, 
Well, all the gear you're going to put in that, the total weight can't exceed 6,099 kilos. That's fully loaded, the both of them. Doesn't matter how much that weighs and how much this weighs, the two numbers added together can't exceed 6,099. So if you look at my mass, if I can tow 3,500 and the Jeep can weigh 2,900, what's that work out to, Jeffrey? Well, I did it the other way around. I did 6,499 it is. I did your GCM minus the 3,000 this can be. Yeah. It left you at 3,099. There you go. There you go. So if you add the 3,500 towing capacity to the GVM of the Jeep, which is the loaded weight, comes in at 6,499. So I've been dudded by Jeep. No, I haven't. That's just the way manufacturers do it. Really good example. Uh, Land Cruiser owners, got to be one here. No, Land Cruiser owners. Oh, one, okay. Well, we're not going to pick on you. <laughs> give, that man a, give that man a stubby cooler <laughs> for any Land Cruiser. So Land Cruiser is a really good uh, numbers to work with. So you can tow three and a half tonne. The GVM of a Land Cruiser is 3350. You add those two numbers together, it becomes 6850, and that's what their combined mass is. So 3,500 3, towing capacity, 3,350 gross vehicle mass, gross combined mass, 6850, the combination of, of those two numbers. I've got all these numbers in my head because I do it on a daily basis. Use... Can I just chuck one in there? Yep. GVM upgrades. Yes. Legalities on GVM upgrades. Um... No, no, yeah. it's good. No, it's no, a good question good. because there's probably people here who want to know about we, we, GV we upgrades. We generally just talk about actually factory, factory numbers. Can we just can we just we might park that and come back. Do, in let's the, let's come in, back in to that. that I'll just get this session. one down and we'll come yeah. back to it because it is a really good question. Yeah. Um, where we at? A Land Cruiser. So my BT50 at the at the front here. I can tow three and a half tonne, same as a Land Cruiser. Uh, the Land Cruiser is 3350. My GVM's 3200. So 3500 and 3200 in my book, 6700. Uh. -uh. We can't add up, it's only six. So Mazda have said, okay, you can tow 3,500 kilos and your car can weigh 3,200, but you can only have a combined weight of six tonne. And that's any of the ranges, Mazdas. Uh, Basically all the dual just cab Just pretty much all the dual cabs, okay? So yeah, don't assume that your towing capacity and the weight of the car, the gross vehicle mass, add up to your combined mass, because unless you've got a Land Cruiser or a Patrol, um, it probably won't. So. They're the compliance ratings you've got. So when we weigh it all, we're weighing everything loaded up and we're going through all these ratings. So that's what it's allowed to weigh. This is what it physically weighs today. You're either over or under. And then obviously there's ways of fixing this, but we need to know where you're sitting with all those numbers. Hopefully you're in the green all the way and hopefully we can say you've got another 60 kilos left in here. So another really good example is people often say, well, I haven't put my food and clothing in here when you weighed it. What would you allow for food and clothing? Anyone got any ideas? Yeah, so like myself and my wife, we go away in our caravan every three weeks and I actually went through the process a few years back about weighing things and just see what we put in. Two bags of clothes, stuff in the fridge, not including beer and wine. Um, it was about 60 kilos every time. They're about, you know, 50 to 60 kilos. So Because when Dave's a, beer goes in, he's overloaded. It was. He, 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 yeah. likes, he likes a frothy or two. <laughs> Uh, cans or stubbies? <laughs> cans, 12.3 kilos. And the heavies? Uh, stubbies, 13. And I don't know about non-alcoholic, as Gary went and asked me. <laughs> it probably would be a difference. Actually, just getting on that, water weighs one kilo, right, one litre. Diesel is 0.85 of a kilo per litre. So it's a little bit lighter, but if you're working out, trying to work out weights, work on one for one, but diesel's a little bit lighter. Um, that's about it. Right, I guess. So um, we had a sort of two hour session put aside here, one hour of us talking and then one hour of answering questions. So thanks very much for coming. I'm done because we've already gone above our hour. <laughs> I'll um, just say, so we've just, you've just heard Jeff spoke about everything to do with the, let's say driving on the road, all your, your mirrors and you're doing things correctly and safely. And Dave's gone through and spoken about your legalities on weights and measures and that sort of stuff. Who have we absolutely scared the bejesus out of and you're gonna trade your track camper in and go and buy a tent instead? Okay. Sorry, no refunds. No refunds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. These sessions aren't designed to scare you. They're designed to have the right information so you can ask the right questions, whether it's from a caravan dealer point of view or from a car point of view. All right. And I know you normally finish with this phrase, but at the caravan show in Sydney a few years ago, 
I had an elderly lady come to me and she goes, I've been told you're the man that can answer all my questions. And I said, yep, I'm here to help you. And she reached into her little bag and she pulled out a manila folder and it was this thick with paperwork. And I've done that, I've gone, oh my God, what have we got here? And she goes, I've got some questions for you. I said, what are the questions? She goes, I don't know. And I said, what do you mean you don't know? She goes, well, I don't know what I don't know, so I don't know what to ask you. So if you didn't know what GVM and ATM and GCM and bore weight, if you didn't know what all these things were, if you didn't know anything about extension mirrors or what they, even that they existed, how are you going to ask either the caravan dealer or the car dealer as to what do I need or am I going to be okay to do this particular car and caravan as a combination? And that's where we sort of come together and put these sessions in place. Right. I'm going to have a really quick, these, sort of my session normally focuses on a product called weight distribution hitches or load levelling the bars. Stabilisers, I'll, I'll let you carry, call them stabilisers. Some people do unfortunately still call those products sway bars. Okay, we're talking about the two big devices which you see connected to the tow bar assembly on the car and then they have A-frame or brackets on the A-frame and then chains hang off that and there's two big spring bars that connect the two. They are load living devices, weight distribution hitches. They're not sway controllers, not sway bars, not anti-sway anything. Right? And I know most of these vans here don't really allow for the provision for them to go on because most of the vans, I think all of the ones I looked at, all have that swing away style jockey wheel and they generally get in the way of using a weight distribution hitch. What do those devices do? Well, they've actually got nothing to do with the caravan. Using or admitting that you need to use a weight distribution hitch has got about 5% to do with the caravan and it's 95% to do with the car. The ball weight of your caravan or your camper trailer is what's going to upset the balance of your car. Nothing else. I won't say nothing else, but that's the main factor. So if you have 300 kilos of ball weight and you apply that straight onto the tow ball, or in most of the cases here, I think you're running DA35s on everything, or Tregs, most of them, or the McHitches. McHitch over here. Yep, okay. <clears throat> So when you apply, regardless of what style of coupling it is, ball, DO35, McHitch, Treg, anything at all, it's all got that tow ball weight being applied to the back of the car, which is going to upset the balance of the car. Whatever your ball weight is, times that by 1.5, and that's how much additional weight you have on the rear axle of the car. So if you have 200 kilos of ball weight, times it by 1.5 is... 300. 300 kilos. That means your rear axle will increase by 300 kilos above empty, standard, sitting there by itself. But what it does at the same time is that 300 kilo increase on the rear, your car is effectively a seesaw. So whatever you do to the rear, the opposite happens to the front. So you get 300 kilos heavier on the rear and you'll get 100 kilos lighter on the front wheels of your car. Less stability, so uh, less efficient braking, uh, less efficient steering, less responsive steering. So you might look at considering weight distribution hitches if your vehicle is being upset to a point where you're feeling less response through the brake pedal, so you, you feel light in the steering wheel. Uh, you might consider looking at weight distribution hitches as one of those sort of products to help fix your, your particular case up. I know a lot of people will say they'll go ahead and put airbags on board. And some cars can take airbags, some cars can't take airbags. So I'm talking ones that you inflate yourself with a tyre gauge. Are they a great product? Absolutely yes. In some cases, I do tell people that you should be running airbags instead of a load levelling device or weight distribution hitch. But you've got to use, it, use airbags correctly as well. Primarily, airbags are designed for load being carried over them, not a metre and a half behind them, which is where your tow ball weight is. So if you're going to go ahead and put airbags on board and then you run around with 300 kilos of ball weight and you go and put 60, 70, 80 psi in those airbags, you are going to do what Steve said, and that is you are going to bend the chassis of your Toyota Hilux. I won't pick on Nissans. <laughs> pick on Toyotas, but I've, I've seen them all. I've seen Toyotas, the Mitsubishis, the Nissans. Uh, I even saw a 79 series dual cab ute with a bent chassis. And he admitted he did stupid stuff. He had far too much ball weight, far too much pressure in his airbags. And then he hit a washout and it snapped the back of the, the 79 series dual cab ute. Right, so it does happen. So using airbags is an alternative, but you've got to make sure you're using them correctly and put in the right amount of pressure you need in there to compensate for whatever, if you are using that instead of weight distribution, to compensate for some of the assistance from the impact that bore weight's going to have on your van, oh, sorry, on your vehicle itself. 
Right? It's all about bore weight. I keep saying it, but bore weight is that key thing which is going to upset, upset most of your balance through your car. Who knows their bore weight? I need three or four hands went up. No one's, ever, no one's ever considered weighing it. Actually putting a scale underneath the front. Oh, it's not the right one. It's not a Heyman oh, Reese scale. it's not the Heyman Reese one. I'll show that side. Sorry? Sounded a bit rattly, that thing. Yeah, it's not a Heyman Reese one. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so knowing your ball weight is critical for what Dave's all gone through in on there as well. But how you load your van is going to, up, is going to impact what your tow ball weight is. And I'm going to use a very short, short story. My father, mum and dad bought a car and caravan a few years ago now, and they hit the road. They left here, they picked up their new van. They left here in Brisbane, up to Rocky, out through Longreach, come back down through the central, and they come back home. Before they did their round Australia trip, which was going to be a one-year holiday, I later referred to mum and dad's one-year holiday as Gilligan's Island. You know the old TV show? It was a three-hour boat cruise. Mum and dad's one-year holiday was five years on the road. They enjoyed the lifestyle that much, they just didn't want to come home again. All right? And that's because they were set up correctly. But before they went away, Mum said, look, can Dad bring the car and van down? I just want you to have a look at it and see if they're all set up OK. Mum and Dad back then had a brand new Nissan Patrol at the time. It was allowed 350 kilos of bore weight. My father had 420 kilos of bore weight. He says, that's impossible, I don't have that much weight on board. He showed me his list. Because everything he put into the van, he wrote down sheets and towels, and then he weighed it. Oop, that's seven kilos. Cutlery and crockery, oop, 300 grams. It was itemised. He only had 380 kilos of stuff that he put into his van. He was allowed 400 kilos. But he had to so underneath with food, gas, water, clothes, everything on board, he had 420 kilos of ball weight. The first thing I said is how. And he goes, well, I don't know how, because it's my list of stuff. How have you loaded it, Dad? He goes, well, it's all stacked in there. I opened the front boot. Front to rear, top to bottom, back to, uh, left to right, packed like a game of Tetris. He had stuff in there that I hadn't even considered taking. How do you need to chock a caravan wheels when you're not, so it doesn't move? In front and rear of at least one wheel? No. As Dave mentioned before, Facebook is a wonderful place for some really, really confusing information. Right? My father read on there, and the per if you do this job, it's no, I'm not having a go at you, but... This person on Facebook said he was a retired OHS officer. And he said, in a perfect world, to stop that van from ever moving, you will chock in the front and rear of every single tyre. So Dad went and bought eight wheel chocks. And I said to Dad, if you chock one wheel, the other three aren't magically going to wander down the caravan park by themselves. All right? So he now has two on board. He also read that you need floor matting. In some caravan parks, I'd never read it, but apparently some caravan parks say you need three sheets. A grand sheet to stop all their stuff coming up, and then a grand sheet to stop all your stuff going through, and then the one you walk on. I've never heard of it, but Dad believed it because it was on Facebook. So he went out and bought enough. He probably had as much, almost as much as what you guys have got here. Rolls and rolls and rolls of this stuff. Right? He's now got one piece, three metres by six metres. That's the size of his annex. You also had a look in there. He said, look... Um, I was on Facebook the other day and they said, when you go to a national park, you can't cut up fallen trees for firewood. Did you know all that? Mm -hmm. Even if it's already fallen, you can't cut it up because it could be the home for an animal. Yeah. Right? So in case they ever weigh in winter, in case, and it was always mum's fault, in case mum felt like a fire, and in case they were in a national park, dad said oh, he took some firewood with him. And I said, yeah, how much is some? And he goes, well, you know your mother and I are on a pension. I said, we can't afford much, so we buy everything in bulk. I went, yeah, he goes, well, I was at like a Woolies service station. They had three bags of firewood for the price of one. I said, yeah, how big are the bags? He goes, they're 20 kilos each. So he had 60 kilos of firewood in that front boot. In the five years they were away, they were never away in winter. They were never in a national park where they wanted a fire anyway. So he, ne he would never have needed it. I took it out before they went away, but he would never have needed it. So where I'm going with this is you can have the right amount of weight of stuff you're carrying with you underneath all your limits, but if you pack it incorrectly, it's going to change your ball weight and it's going to potentially then affect how this toes behind you. Too much ball weight or too little ball weight. Both have different ways the car and the van are going to react together. 
I'm going to let me take over Dave's session here, and then I'll come. Then I'll, I'll just touch on that. Anybody got one of those? Yep. So a few that got them. Um, I'm going to say that is good. Um, try to avoid using them on anything other than a 50 millimetre ball. So if you don't have that full cup type arrangement ball coupling, they're just dangerous. Yeah, I'll say the word. <laughs> they're dangerous. You have to be under the plate. <clears throat> yeah, but even, yeah, un under the plate would be okay. But even still, if that thing slips just a few degrees to the side, even if you're directly under the A-frame, it's only got to go a few degrees that way. And that is, it's hard to see it, but it's a big spring. So when you push that down, so you lower the coupling or the A-frame onto this, this main piece slides inside the body, and then you read your ball weight on there. So if it's onto anything other than a ball coupling, if that twists just that much, it's possible that it's going to then take off like a projectile. All right, so keep that in mind. When Dave sort of suggests potentially running a, like a square plate or something on top of these so they're not going to push and slide anything else that way as well. Yeah, that's, that's going to stop the van from falling, but it's not going to stop that from shooting out at bullet speed. Something like that, guys. Something like that. Just so there's less chance that it's going to shift or slip or spin underneath the A-frame. Day, a couple of months ago, we had that fly out when he did it. Yeah, in my previous life at Heyman Reese, when I left, they were currently going through a court case for someone who'd lost some teeth out of their jaw because it took off at such speed that it hit the man in the jaw and broke his teeth out. All right, so they're a great product, but they need to be careful on how you use them. And I'll let Dave explain because it's his. Kick up. Yeah. If you're using them, the critical thing is you've got to use them correctly to get the right ball weight. As I said, they're just a big spring inside of there. So as you apply pressure here, it squeezes down and you can see on the side of here, the numbers are stamped into it. So when it finishes squashing down, it's gonna tell you you've got 300 kilos of ball weight, for example. But you need to measure the ball weight at the coupling at the caravan's travel height. So if, so if this is squashed down to 300 millimeters, for example, the van is leaning further forward than what it is when it's at travel height it's going to give you a reading different to what your actual ball weight is. I'll use Dave's presentation, single axle <laughs> caravan. If I'm lower in the nose compared to my travel height, am I going to have more or less ball weight at the front of the van? So I'm saying more on a single weight caravan, more. Right. What if I'm on a dual axle caravan? If I go down in the nose below the 400 millimeters, below the travel height, is my ball weight still going to be higher on here than what it really is? I was going to give you a prize until then. There's two nods. Yeah. No. On a dual axle caravan, the lower you go at the front of the van compared to level height or travel height, the ball weight's going to get lighter. Because this front axle, if there was a front axle here, it will get heavier and the rear axle will get lighter, but that front axle is going to carry all, the, all that weight for you. And the other way around, if you go higher in the nose, Am I going to have a higher reading at the scale or a lower reading at the scale? You're going to have a higher reading. Because you normally, that means you're trying to lift the front of the caravan up at the coupling stage, you're trying to lift that up. So you're then effectively pulling the front axle off the ground. So it'll get heavier here and heavier on the rear axle. So you said, caravan, uh, so caravan hitched, measure your coupling height, then unhitch the two, put the scale underneath. When it finishes compressing, so jockey wheels off the ground, measure the same height to the underside of the coupling. If it's not the same height, you may have to put a spacer or a block of timber or something underneath here so that it starts high when it finishes compressing, it gets back down to that travel height measurement. Right? The, the, key, the key word is uh, tra um, compressed height must equal travel height. Yeah. Yep. yep. With Dave, Dave's got one there and I've got one in my unit as well. We use digital scales. So the movement is, it's not even a millimetre. Yeah. It's just a load cell, so it doesn't move. So we can set our scale up that as soon as the jockey wheel comes off the ground, we're already at the right travel height and we get the most accurate bore weight reading there. Mm -hmm. um, since we're not talking more weight distribution, I'll start with one there first. So if you, ideally we need to get the vans to travel as level as possible or when I do my setups, I try and get my van sitting about 10 to 15 millimetres lower in the nose compared to level. 
Right? And the reason I do that, or how I can do that, is by using things like what I've got here, which is adjustable trailer ball mounts. So I can adjust this headpiece up and down on the shank to achieve the right tow ball height that I need. So the van is about 10 to 15 millimeters in the lower in the nose. And the reason I do that, if you can get your van, we don't want it 50 mil lower, but if you can get it just 10 to 15 millimeters lower in the nose, it's a race car spoiler. It's leaning forward that much, I won't go that much, but it's leaning forward like that. As you drag it through the air, air pressure wants to naturally push the, th the van down to the road and help stabilize it. It doesn't compensate for bad loading and whatever else you might have done, but just through natural towing behavior, if it's leaning forward, it'll increase, help increase the stability of the van through natural air pressure. Right? Level's okay, there's nothing wrong with level. And nose high, not ideal, but it's not terrible, but you're gonna lose that effect of air pressure help setting the caravan down as well. Right? So consider whether you're using weight distribution or you need one, sort of, one of those adjustable tra trailer ball mounts, consider getting one of those to get your van just leaning forward um, a little bit there. Right, that'll help, it definitely helps increase your stability. And the last little thing I'll quickly talk about here, and this sort of stemmed from a lot of the questions that Bernie sent through the other day. Um, one of the things that no caravaner likes to have is a van that sways. And Jess been through it there, and what sort of a sway condition and how to control it with your brake controller. But if you can prevent it from happening in the first place, it's got to be better than trying to fix it after it's begun. So it sounds like a Heyman Reese ad. I'm not trying to be a bit of a big sure. Kev. <laughs> I'm not trying to be big Kev and say, but wait, there's more. All right? But if you can use any sort of device which works in conjunction with everything else you've done to help give the car and caravan stability, well, it's got to be a good idea. And I've only brought, the, only brought the one in here. But there's two different styles of sway, mechanical sway controllers. So we spoke electrical stuff before, but there's two different types of mechanical sway controllers. Smaller, lightweight one, up to about 200 kilos of bore weight, is this friction sway controller. So what it does is this black piece has a bracket which we attach to the A-frame of the van. And the gold bit has, you might have seen on a lot of your weight distribution heads, there's a little tab off to one side where you can get a bracket which goes underneath your normal tow ball and you put a little separate little tow ball beside your initial, your normal coupling. Even if it's a DO35, you can still use it. So this little ball beside it, when you have it have the handle loose, they slide in the inner side of each other. Not that far, because you <laughs> go too far. But that slides in and out. As I wind the handle, I don't go that far, pull the gold bit for me. It grips, the main body is gripping now the slide bar, the part attached to the car. So as you're driving down the highway, if a large truck overtakes you, or if a crosswind, crosswind, a crosswind blows across the nose of the van, that's one of the causes of a van starting to sway. This prevents the movement from starting in the, in the first place. But the weight of your car and the weight of your van is more than what this clamping force is. So when you turn corners, lefts and rights, normal round roundabouts, it's enough that it overcomes that clamping force in here and that, that slide bar still slides in and out when you're driving around the corners normally. Right? Preventing the start this way rather than trying to fix it once it's begun. And there is another heavier device called the dual cam sway controller, which works in conjunction. You have to have a weight distribution hitch or a Heyman Reese weight distribution hitch for the dual cam sway controller to work, where this can work just with anything at all. You see, if it was that, even if it was that tongue there, that tow ball, trailer ball mount there, you can get a bracket which goes underneath that tow ball or underneath your DO35 pin and puts a little tab to the side. So then this can then sit over it and still work for you. So Off-road, off it comes off. Because right? it, it is just, they're in the box. There's just two little pins, one that slides in here and one that slides in there. So you just pull them out and then that just gets stored in your van or in your car, whatever, when you're going off-road. So we, I sort of don't normally focus too much on these because they are, they are a very good product. I just said, they're not seen, anybody ever seen one before? Look at that, there's 50 people here and no one's seen one. Yeah. I'm going to say, even in my life as Heyman Reese, I spent 12 years working for them, I, I don't think we, 
as a company, I don't think they explain the benefits of devices like this enough. Right? And then Alco come along, it's another couple over here, so they've got the electronic sway controls. Electronic sway controls are fantastic. I've said they do work very, very well. Um, I'm now an Alco and, D and Dexter approved installer and repairer as well, so I can retrofit these devices uh, onto your caravans for you as well. But so they are reactive. They wait for the van to move and move a certain amount and then they engage or they apply the trailer brakes on the caravan for you. Right? But potentially, you might have already lost control. If it moves just not enough, left or right, and it's already moving you know, a metre either side of centre, and it's, but that's still within its working parameter and all of a sudden it gets a big push while it's out to one side, then you've already lost control of the caravan behind you. But don't, don't get me wrong, they are great. They do work very well when, they're, when everything does meet the conditions. Just remember too, guys, uh, talking about the sway and that, these are well alignable, so you can get them well aligned. Oh, that's good to know. To eliminate some sway as well. Um, they do because of the, the independent suspension, uh, but they are well alignable. So you can get, there's guys that come out with their laser aligning in your driveway. So yep, yep. The truckology, there's a, a, quite a few of them that do. That's good. Hey, Gaz, just on the um, table, I didn't mention it, but what is, pre what is the optimum ball weight? What is optimum ball weight? Anybody know? Anybody heard any magic numbers or figures or anything they've read on Facebook? <laughs> Depends on you. European countries are Europeans are five to seven. Five to five. Five That's to a really seven good reply. Percent. That lady a prize there, please. That was a real. That is, that European is really type important. vans are, are five to seven percent of the overall weight of the van. So if this weighed 2,000 kilos, then your ball weight would be around that 1,000 to 220 kilos of ball weight. Australian type vans, one's built for the Australian market, the closer you can get to 10%, the better. So if that van weighs 2,000 kilos, you'd like to have around about 200 kilos of ball weight. Somewhere between eight and 12 is okay, nine and 11 is okay, it's all okay, but the, just being, you keep in mind that the lighter the ball weight that gets, it doesn't cause sway, but the lighter the ball weight gets, the more likely you're going to have a van that's going to continue to sway once it's received an external force starting the sway. So as a truck goes past, if you're sitting on 6%, you know, somewhere on the lighter end, it's not going to sway just because it's too light. But if a truck goes past and just gives that air pressure, gives the side of the van a bit of a push, it's going to be less likely to recover by itself if the ball weight's at the lighter end of the scale. So just keep that in mind. If low ball weight doesn't cause it, it just means it's hard, to, hard won't correct itself. Less likely to. And it's also, don't forget, ball weight's really, really important for the caravan, but don't forget, going back to what I was talking about here, it's really important for the car as well. Yeah. So depending on where you put load in this caravan, the ball weight changes dramatically sometimes. Um, so we said it was 240 kilos of water here. You said there was one here and one here? Yep. So totally dry, the ball weight on these is 140 kilos. There yep. you go, 140. So, so no yep. water in them, no. By the yep. time you add these two fill these two water tanks 240, yep. it could go to 140, it could easily get 220 kilos. You're about, you're about 50%. Yeah, so, and if you'd run one over the other, so if you run the full front one empty and the second one, sorry, the front one full and the second one empty, the bore weight's gonna be heavier. If you run the second one full and the front one empty, the bore weight's gonna be slightly lighter. And then as you transfer water to your gray water tank, the ball weight's potentially going to get lighter again because you're taking water out of the front of the axles and putting it behind the axle. Right. So but it's not, sorry? Sorry, when we do the handover on, I always make sure that the front water tank's full on those. Yep. Great, yep. The reason being is just because they're empty. Yes. Um, and they are more weight twice on the rear because you've got the rear pole, the spare tyres, your outdoor barbecue setting and everything, your batteries and everything are in the rear. They're all rear, yep. The yep. So they are more weight on the rear than the front. You actually fill the front water tank, they actually tail off out yeah. when they're empty. Not surprised. And even when they're full, I tell people if they're going out, fill both tanks, yeah, use your rear first. Mm -hmm. So yep. that when you're coming home and you've got half, say so you've used the, the front tank, half the front tank, you've still got some weight in the forward compartment as well. Yep. So you, you don't get that uneven weight distribution over the back of it. The vans are generally built with a lighter bore weight at tear than the 10% because 
how often do you tow the van empty? Potentially once. When you pick it up here and take it home, that may be the only time the thing will ever be empty ever again. So otherwise, if they built vans with a, a nice heavy bore weight at tear, well then it would be limiting how much you load you can put in these front compartments, what you can put on the slide, you know, how much water you can carry. If the, if the bore was heavy at tear, you're going to be having uh, more issues with stability of loading it because you're not going to have the room to put stuff where you need to. But right you had here. a question? First thing I do on, a, on my own QC check, they do this at the factory as well. What they'll do is they'll put a, like, they'll fill the water tanks for like a quarter. Then they do their water pressure test on it, make sure these taps are running, the pump's working and everything else like that. But when I receive it, what I do then is then I fill the front water tank and say the rear has like water full, I'll bring it up to half. So the rear water tank's got half in it, the front's got full, and it just seems to balance it out to a point where it's nicer to drive home. Um, a lot of people have said, oh, you know, I don't want the tanks filled because, you know, they're poly, poly tanks and you get the taste of this and the money taste in them and everything else like that, which is true. But then they ring me up when they get home and go, that was terrifying. 60 k's an hour and I couldn't tow it. Yeah, 60 k, yeah, exactly. I, I got home, that's the worst thing I've ever towed. It's pretty freaked me out. Yeah. I thought it was going to lose Are it. Are they balanced right to left as well, like how they're constructed? Well, the, 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 tanks, the tanks, the water tanks and Not the grey water tank in these are dead centre. I meant the, the van itself where you've got... So it's you've got more, it. as it sits now, it, well, this one's got water in the front tank, but as it sits now, when it's delivered to me, when it comes off the tow truck, um, off the transporter, and I actually sit it in the yard at its perfect height, because you don't go too high up on the jockey wall as well, It'll be down like that. It'll be sitting basically. That's the rear, and it'll sit up like that. I think your your question was: Is it the same yeah. weight on the left same left wheels as on the right exactly right hand wheels? Same. Yeah. So right to left, how it's all exactly been set up, all balanced. Yep. Okay. Exactly Good. the same. I always want to answer. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Most. Rule of thumb, we'll always recommend you run full water tanks. Yeah. Just especially what especially what Steve's saying is because when you pick this up empty, like we've got all this huge big storage compartment up here that we're going to put our fridge in and everything else and, and you know bedding everything that's going to go in this as soon as we start putting well was it 660 kilos of weight in it we're 660 kilos lighter at the moment so it's going to be empty so if we want to get some weight in it and what steve's saying is get that weight up here we'll make sure that we've got a bit of weight there just going on to what you were saying about um weights left to right just about every caravan i weigh the weights will never be the same left to right because don't forget, on one side, um, I haven't had a look in here, but uh, where's, we got a, oh no, well we got a fridge up the front, but just say a normal tandem axle caravan. Fridges on one side, usually. Um, dinettes on, one, on the same side, usually. Other side might have the kitchen. So people, a lot of my customers go, oh, I wanna make sure I'm right, left to right. Number one, we've gotta do it exactly on level ground to, to, to prove that. But I often try and say, why bother? I mean, as this is going down the road, whether it's two wheels or four wheels, they're all independent. They're all working like this. As it's going down, it's a constant, constant rate of change. No, heavier, yeah. heavier on one side of the van compared to the other is less, is less likely to cause sway than too much weight at the rear compared to not enough weight at the yeah. front. It's more yeah. of a front to weight issue is going to be a sway rather than left to, left to right. And that's yeah. every sort of, every brand of can. It doesn't matter whether it's the Oztrak or, you know, backyard Bob's Caravans. It's front to rear is more of an issue for stability and control than left to right is. So the general rule of thumb is full water tanks because it's the largest mass weight, closest to the tyres and closest to the ground. Great stability, regardless whether the van's got anything else in it or not. Mm -hmm. We always recommend that. If you don't want to fill your water tanks... It's totally fine. That 120 totally. kgs would be in it, you're going to put on the floor, in your caravan, directly above your axles, and you're going to strap it down. Yeah. You know, so if you, yeah, you pick it up here from Steve with 120 kilos of water in it, if you drain it, make sure you put sufficient weight forward of the axle to help balance out the overall load distribution of your van. Because as, as you said, good point, you know, your spare wheel and the rear fold out and everything on the rear. So there's 60 kilos of weight. You know, 30 to 35 kilos. Yeah. Um, you've, got your, you've got your kitchen, your external kitchen. You've also got the little second pantry drawer. You've got your battery, your hot water. Yeah. You've got three 
120 ampere AGMs, which are, you know, 35 kilos, 40 kilos mm. plus. Yep. Your hot water system is in there. Your mattress is all from basically this point Hear that. Back. Yep. So that area there is the greatest scent what, for weight. Yep. That whole area. So, you know, you've got, and again, not only that, you've already got your batteries, but you've got your management system, you know, everything for your solar, all your plumbing, everything is all there. So your weight is here, and that's the reason I fill the front water tank so that when you pick it up and you're driving it home, you're not ringing me when you get home going, oh, yeah, no, no. I'm, going, I'm bringing it home. <laughs> I'm scared. I want my money back. I'm scared. That was terrifying. How many, um, how many people have come up to shows to tell us sleepless bad things like that? Yeah. Pick the van up, you and... Perfectly. And, and you know, I've I've been in the game for 20 years, and I've never heard anybody, I've never heard a single salesman at any show or any any dealership at all say they fill the front tanks because they're aware that light bore weights are are bad. I've never heard anybody say that actually help, to help you get home safely because it's empty, that they they're basically Steve doing it for you. Yeah. So we, we we keep saying it. I keep saying it. That 10%. You've got to be you know closer to 10% you can get the better. But in saying that, if you have 10% bore weight, but then do have, still have far too much weight hanging off the rear. So maybe you've put a big toolbox on the back and you've got the generator and you've got, you know, 20 litres of fuel for the generator, or you've got all your temp poles or whatever, all hanging off the rear. 10% is irrelevant. It's, the 10% is still there, but now you've got a pendulum. You now have the bottom end of a grandfather clock. So now even though good balance at this end, if you have too much weight behind it, it won't cause it to sway. But it means if, there's, if the weight is too much weight's back there, once it starts, it's very hard to control itself or correct itself because it's just going to start and continue to get worse because you put too much stuff, you know, potentially at the rear and not enough back over the front. I'd rather you run around with 12% ball weight with your generator and your toolbox and everything on the front than run around with 10% with, you know, 60 kilos of additional load that wasn't built in the factory hanging off the back end of the, of the van. As long as it's not exceeding all the other weights, absolutely yes.